So this is part two of the Oncogene Targeted Therapies uh, lecture for cell pathology and infection, lecture seven. And we're following on from the Oncogene uh, gene amplification and uh, gene duplication work that we've just covered for HER2 and epidermal growth factor receptor. And what we find is that many patients treated with Herceptin or with Cetuximab for EGFR blocking do not respond from the outset. Almost all cases that have got metastatic disease um, in initial clinical trials of cetuximab and herceptin eventually stopped responding and subsequently died. So what we need to think about is we're given therapies on the basis that cancers are what we call addicted to a particular oncogene. We use the term oncogene addiction for HER2 and EGFR. And if the cancer cells are addicted to HER2 signaling, why doesn't herceptin work for the majority of HER2 positives? And why doesn't cetuximab work for the majority of EGFR positive cancers? So to find out, we need to go back to the signaling pathway. So this is um, EGFR, HER2, dimerizing. Um, these are all part of the tyrosine kinase family of growth factor receptors. Uh, this phosphorylation here is the tyrosine kinase domain and that phosphorylation is effectively passed on down this pathway or down this pathway. What we find is many cancers have both overexpression of HER2 or EGFR and downstream of that they may have a RAS mutation which gives constitutive RAS signaling from this point onwards or RAF mutation which gives constitutive signaling from this point onwards or maybe they have a PI3 kinase mutation or an ACT mutation that gives constitutive survival down this pathway or defects in P10, usually loss of P10, which can also promote uh, cell survival. So if you are blocking up here with an antibody, but RAS is permanently switched on, blocking up there is not going to have any effect on proliferation. It might have an effect on survival, but equally if PI3 kinase is mutated and activated, because that's an oncogene, blocking with an antibody up here is not going to affect whether those cells are apoptotic resistant or not. So any mutations downstream of the growth factor receptor could render those antibody therapies to the growth factor receptor itself, it could render those completely useless. So this is showing the same signaling pathway with a few other uh, components shown in. So there's the growth factor binding to the growth factor receptor. This is the tyrosine kinase domain. The letter Y is tyrosine. This is passed on to a complex signaling pathway which effectively passes on that signal to RAS. So this is the first one, the first of the oncogenes that uh, you will particularly know about. And you know that RAS codon 12 and 13 mutations result in constitutively active RAS. The next thing on this proliferation pathway is RAF and mutations affect RAF. There's a, a V600E mutation which we'll cover shortly that often occurs in RAF to render that one permanently active. And then MEC and ERK can also pick up mutations to make those uh, constantly active. So any of these mutations will mean that the growth factor receptor inhibitor doesn't work. Similarly, PI3 kinase, ACT, and various other um, genes on this pathway. So here's RAS. You've seen this before. This is the RAS sequence. This is the glycine to valine. Um, mutation at codon 12 and you also get glycine to valine mutation at codon 13. These are missense mutations and these make RAS constantly active, cannot be switched off. Now because oncogenes are mutated at very specific or localized places on the gene, uh, we can look for those mutations by simple PCR assays. So just by performing PCR amplification of this region here and then having a probe that recognizes either the GGC or the GCT, um, we can tell the difference between wild type RAS and mutant RAS. And we do this by quantitative polymerase chain reaction um, assays. And I'll go through the TACMAN technology about how uh, those mutations are detected uh, in a few slides time. So we know that lung cancers overexpress epidermal growth factor receptor, breast cancers overexpress HER2. Uh, for lung cancer and EGFR overexpression, there are two major drugs, uh, panitumumab and cetuximab, 
they both act upon EGFR overexpressing tumours, so are only given to EGFR overexpressing uh, patients with EGFR overexpressing tumours, and that is determined by either immunohistochemistry or FISH. We've just seen that in part one of this lecture. So both of these monoclonal antibodies were approved for use in 2004 to 2006 for both colon and lung cancers. In 2009, the FDA, so the, the American um, approval agency, overruled this approval. And the reason why is because very few people were actually responding to the drug, despite having EGFR amplifications. And it was found that there's insufficient benefit for these agents unless the tumours were free from KRAS mutations, because lung tumours and colon tumours often have KRAS mutations. So when this original approval was overturned, it was rewritten and said that the tumours have to be EGFR positive, they have to be KRAS mutant negative at codon 12, 13 and at codon 61, All, but also any mutation in BRAF or PI3 kinase would also render the drug useless. And what was subsequently found is uh, triple wild type tumours, that was wild type for KRAS, uh, BRAF and PI3 kinase, would tend to respond, whereas less than 10% of unselected tumours that were EGFR positive would respond. So if you can select out the ones that are EGFR positive, verify that they are lacking in, in mutations in RAS, RAF or PI3 kinase, then you would find that the vast majority of those patients would gain clinical benefit from those very expensive monoclonal antibody therapies. Now this sort of technology is being rolled out for other cancers uh, and other targeted therapies and we see more and more targeted therapies requiring KRAS mutation, PI3 kinase mutation, BRAF mutations. Uh, so we have to show that the, the cancers are free of these mutations and overexpress the drug target. So I'm now going to get on to how the specific oncogenic point mutations are detected. Um, and these are, as I mentioned earlier, they're in oncogenes, and in oncogenes have mutations in very predictable amino acid residue. residue. So very specific codons become mutated to change very specific amino acids. So we know about codon 12, 13, 61. For RAS, you get a V600E mutation, so that's failing to glutamic acid at codon 600 for BRAF, and that activates BRAF. So we can design assays to look at just at that region. I mean, we can do direct DNA sequencing, but there's a limitation here in that the wild type allele might dilute the signal, and therefore we often can't see a minority of mutated cells. So instead what we do is do a TACMAN allele specific polymerase chain reaction uh, assay that can tell the difference between the wild type and the mutant alleles. So I mentioned this in the uh, Oncotype DX uh, assay. This is a quick illustration of TACMAN technology and we have a primer here that anneals to the target. Uh, DNA polymerase, TAC polymerase will extend that target as part of DNA amplification and there'll be another primer at the other end of this uh, amplified region going the opposite way but the key point here is that type polymerase if it finds a probe bound to DNA blocking its path it will come along cleave off a reporter from a quencher and that will give rise to a fluorescence signal so this is TACMAN based um, uh, TACMAN based quantitative PCR and this slide illustrates what is going on in different scenarios. So what I've done is um, got three different scenarios. Homozygous wild type, so that's normal. Wild type means normal. Homozygous mutant, where there is no wild type allele. And then heterozygous. And heterozygous is a situation that you see with most oncogenes because oncogenes are activated by a mutation on one homolog which is dominant over the other so you often for oncogene mutations one allele is mutated the other one is wild type so what we're going to have is a primer here that's going to um, going to allow dna polymerase to go this way on the other strand which is not shown there'll be a primer somewhere off screen to the right which is going to allow dna polymerase to copy this way but we don't need to see that at the moment uh, and what we're also going to do is have two different probes one probe 
which has got a reporter and a quencher that recognises the wild type sequence and that probe will be about 10 to 12 nucleotides in length and another probe that recognises the mutant sequence uh, and what, as we saw with RAS we got a very specific change and this change is shown here we've got a GGC to GTC so what we can do is have one probe which maybe goes GG C, GCC, um, GGC, GGT, and then GG, GTG. So that is the wild type sequence. And then you have another probe, which is the mutant probe, where is in the middle of it, you've got this GTC instead of this GGC. So the only difference between the two probes is one nucleotide change. And that is enough to make those probes preferentially bind to wild type DNA or mutant DNA. So back to these diagrams, this is the reporter, this is the sequence that recognizes the target, this is going to be about 12 nucleotides in length, and the difference between the green wild type and the blue mutant is one single nucleotide change. Now because these probes only differ by one nucleotide, there is some cross-reactivity, so you can't get it so that the probes, uh, the wild type probe just doesn't bind at all to the mutant probe, but you do get a preferential binding of wild type probe to wild type. But what we see is if we've got a heterozygous sample, we find that both the wild type and the mutant probes are both equally cleaved by type polymerase and their reporters are released at exactly equal amounts. Um, and I'll show you some amplification plots to illustrate this on the next slide. So this is a, a, a type polymerase based mutation detection assay and this is an assay that was run by one of my uh, master students who do this in their lab and this is detecting BRAF in um, some tumor cells and what we can see here we've got uh, it's called a SNP assay allele, uh, SNP assay single nucleotide polymorphism Assay. That's just what these assays are called because they're mostly used to detect polymorphisms. But we're detecting point mutations. It's exactly the same technology. So we've got allele 1, um, allele 1 in blue, allele 2 in green. And it's showing the amplification of allele 1 versus allele 2. And you can see that in this particular sample, allele 1 and allele 2 are being amplified at pretty much the same rate. Here we can see that this sample, which turned out to be homozygous for allele 1, gives a stronger ampli amplification for allele 1 in blue and a weaker amplification for the other uh, allele. Whereas conversely, this one was homozygous for allele 2. And what you can see clearly is you get earlier amplification for allele 2 in green, later detection of allele 1. Now, it's because of this of some... Uh, probe cross reactivity which means that this green line here exists and this blue line here exists they are not 100% efficient for or specific for their target but you get preferential amplification from the most preferred probe now by a combination of the CT value the CT value being the cycle of which uh, this line crosses an arbitrary threshold that we can draw across here so let's say draw a line across here, CT value of that would be 23 and CT value of the green line would be about 30 odd. So taking into account both the CT value and the magnitude of amplification on this scale, this uh, allele here is weakly amplified so it's got a high CT value and a low total amount of DNA, this one the opposite way around. We can take that information and plot it on an allele discrimination plot and work out that everything where those both two alleles had equal amplification were heterozygous where one predominates their homozygous so homozygous mutants are there and homozygous wild types are down here we call this an allele discrimination plot so we can use this to find out oncogene mutations and what we find for most samples is most samples sit down here homozygous wild type and then anything that's heterozygous tend to be samples that's got a single oncogene mutation, so they tend to end up here. 
it's quite unusual to get homozygous oncogene mutations. It's not unheard of, but it's quite unusual. Now what we can also do is use this technology to analyze hundreds of oncogene locations simultaneously on a single array. And this is a, um, a 384 well PCR plate looking for lots of different oncogene mutations in lots of different samples. Now this slide shows how this mutation detection strategy can be turned into a semi-high throughput system and to do this we use Tagman assays which are freeze-dried onto the bottom of a 384 well plate um, plate and you add DNA from a formalin fixed paraffin embedded uh, tumor section you extract that DNA and add that DNA with uh, Tagman master mix and you know all the type polymerase and buffers and add that to all 384 wells and then amplify 384 different oncogene mutations because each individual well has got a different primer, forward primer, different reverse primer and different mutation detection probe in there. And what we can see, it doesn't particularly matter about what the scale is, here what we're seeing is a spike and this is showing preferential amplification of a mutated, a mutant allele that is being detected in the samples. So each of these lines represent is the readout from one individual patient's tumour and then the spikes represent individual mutations uh, and if you've got a big spike up here that means that the mutant allele has been detected when it shouldn't have otherwise been detected. So it's the increase in CT value versus a normal sample, like a reference sample. So this particular spike here just happens to be RAF and that one and this one over here is EGFR and some of these in the middle of KRAS. So this means that you could take a patient sample, extract its DNA, uh, mix that DNA with uh, a universal PCR master mix, add that to 384 wells on a plate. Each of those wells contains, uh, contains different primers and probes, amplify the whole lot, and within a couple of hours you've genotyped for over 300 different possible mutations and found the mutations in all of those different genes. So this is a sort of technology that's used to screen for mutations that would prevent these targeted therapies from working. Now if we know what we're looking for we can just use basic DNA sequencing as shown here. This is um, how it was done before the Tagman assays were rout routinely done. This is just a RAS uh, DNA sequencing of codon 61 uh, where you've got your wild type allele uh, your homozygous mutants and the heterozygous there. So you can see you've got uh, two peaks, the pink and the green, the pink being a T and the green being an A. So that's the mutation at codon 61. So you can just do DNA sequencing, but that's really only suitable if you know that that particular cancer only has that particular mutation. So everything I've been talking about so far is targeted therapies which are peptides, you know, your cetuximab and your Herceptin. I've mentioned tyrosine kinase inhibitors earlier, and there are many of these. Uh, lipatinib, uh, which is a tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitor of HER2, so this binds on the tyrosine kinase domain. Gefitinib or Iressa uh, binds to EGFR, which is obviously the same gene that, uh, the same protein that cetuximab binds, which blocks EGFR as well. So in patients which are EGFR positive, you could use cetuximab as an antibody outside the cell, or chifitinib to block the EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase domain. Both of those are possible strategies. Now for other tumour types, there's um, a drug called vemurafenib, and that works where the tumour has picked up a BRAF mutation. And BRAF is almost always mutated at amino acid at codon 600, which is a V to E mutation. Now, because this only occurs in cancer cells, a specific inhibitor that recognizes the V600E mutated BRAF has been designed, that is called vemurafenib, and this works in uh, cutaneous melanomas, about half of which have this V to E mutation. And this can easily be detected by polymerase chain reaction uh, if you have got uh, a whole load of cutaneous melanomas, you need this, you can use exactly the same. Um, Tagman assay 
to detect the V600E mutation in all of those uh, melanomas. So this is the growth factor signaling pathway in a slightly different cartoon form. There's your growth factor, there's your receptor types in kinase. Signal gets passed on to RAS and RAF. That gets passed on to MEK and ERK and that leads on to your uh, induction of cyclin D and proliferation. If BRAF is muted, uh, mutated to its V600E form, and this mutation also occurs in other cancers, not just melanoma, if the V600E mutation is present, that results in constitutive signaling from BRAF downwards, so basically MEK and ERK are active and you get aberrant proliferation. If we can block BRAF V600E protein activity, and here we've got uh, vemurafenib coming in here, this will switch off signaling to MEK and ERK and we will get cell cycle arrest. So this strategy works briefly. Um, I'm going to say briefly, it works for a period of a few months usually. So in, in melanomas that have got BRAF mutations, use vemuraf vemurafenib, the tumors completely regress if they are BRAF mutant. However, cancers, as we know, accumulate mutations at a high rate. And what we find with vemurafenib is if you treat them, uh, treat the, these cancers with vemurafenib, eventually the tumors pick up a mutation in MEK or ERK, which renders the vemurafenib useless. So this drug tends to give patients six, maybe nine months of extra life, but then subsequently the tumors tend to come back and those tumors that come back are, are MEK or ERK mutant because MEK or ERK have been switched on by a additional somatic mutation. Okay, so this is a summary of everything that we've learnt. Uh, the oncogene mutations drive tumor growth. So this could be the Achilles heel of uh, the cancer. That is the weak point. And we call this oncogene addiction. If HER2 overexpression, EGFR overexpression, or um, BRAF V600E mutation, if those mutations exist, we call that oncogene addiction. Uh, Aceptin treats the HER2 overexpressing. Cetuximab treats the EGFR overexpressing. Uh, there are many other types of therapies like this out there. They're all incredibly expensive. We test for the presence of oncogene overexpression or overactivity before treatment. So that can be FISH, um, or immune histochemistry, or even SISH, which I've talked about in a previous module, Biomedical Investigations. So that's for HER2 and EGFR overexpressing tumours. However, as I've shown in this uh, half of the lecture, if anything downstream of that receptor is mutant and activated, then there is no point targeting the receptor with an antagonist. It will not work. Therefore, we can start looking for mutations downstream of the receptor in the candida oncogenes, looking at mutation hotspots by polymerase chain reaction, uh, either doing single assays or that mutation panel approach on the 384 well plates. And at the end of all of this testing, we find out which patients overexpress the oncogene and have all of their signaling pathways downstream being wild type. And if that is the case, we can again then give the person that very expensive drug, which will extend life. If there are mutations downstream of the growth factor receptor, that drug will not be given because it's A, very expensive, and B, won't provide any patient benefit. And those patients would then move preferentially onto a cytotoxic chemotherapy regime instead. Okay, so that's a complete summary of the current status of stratified cancer medicine.